LegalizeFreedom.com Why are we here? Where do we come from? Where are we going? From the nature of reality to the future of humanity. Beyond politics, poverty and war. LegalizeFreedom.com Greetings and welcome once again to LegalizeFreedom.com. I'm your host Greg Moffat and my guest today is Rhys Gervin who joins us to discuss some of the ideas in his book, The Universe and the Psyche. What is the origin of the universe? Was it created in a big bang? Or might it always have existed? We are told that matter creates consciousness, but could it be that consciousness creates matter? What can we learn from the patterns in physical reality? From DNA to galaxies, spirals appear everywhere in nature. Do they hold a key to understanding? In choosing to disregard the non-material, modern science has lost 95% of the universe to dark matter, dark energy, and other convoluted theories. By shifting our perspective on reality, what can we learn about the nature of the 95%? Is it possible that the fundamental nature of reality is information? Scientific materialism tells us that life arose randomly, without purpose, and without meaning. And yet many ancient traditions speak of the universe and all life in it as imbued with both, and ordered by a higher intelligence that some call God. With all the murder and mayhem carried out in the name of religion, it's easy to understand why so many resist the idea of such a higher intelligence. But if we set aside the prejudices attached to both the scientific and the mystical views, and merge the best of both models, a more complete picture of reality begins to emerge. Our planet stands on the brink of disaster, and many of its conflicts stem from fundamentally differing worldviews. But could reconciliation between the scientific and the mystical, material and non-material, offer hope for our long-term future? Hello and welcome, Brace, and thank you so much for joining us today on LegalizeFreedom.com. Hi, Greg. Uh, it's good to be here with you. It's, uh, it's been a while, but we've finally managed to organise it. Yeah, we've been back and forth for about a year, haven't we? <laughs> yeah, pretty close. <laughs> Today, Reese, we're going to discuss some of the ideas in a little book that you put together called The Universe and the Psyche. And it's essentially dealing with the big questions, which is close to my heart here, because if I've got a kind of a, a motto for the show, it's kind of, why are we here? Where do we come from? Where are we going? These are the, yep. big, the, you know, the, the eternal big questions. Before we get into this, just tell listeners a little bit about your background, but particularly your interest in this area. I mean, from my perspective, how can anyone not be interested, but you've got a particular interest? Yeah, I agree. I mean, it's, it certainly should be everybody's interest, is my feeling. Um, I spend most of my time in Australia. I work in the construction industry, but, uh, I've always had a fascination with, with, uh, mysticism, basically. Um, discovered Krishnamurti when I was 18, uh, 20, I dropped out of university. I ended up in India. Um, which is a great place to go and, and open the, uh, the boundaries of your soul, so to speak. Um, hung out on a hill with, uh, with a yogi over there and got very interested in, um, Indian philosophy, Om philosophy, uh, especially Kashmir Shaivism. And, um, it's, it's just been an ongoing interest I've had in my life. So for the last 30 odd years, I've been gathering pieces of jigsaw puzzle basically as I go. And I've, I've looked at, uh, the Chinese system with, um, the yin yang, um, the bagua, the I Ching, um, the flower of life from Egypt, uh, the, the pie concept from Greece. And, uh, it's all kind of linked together. And finally I decided that I have a good picture of it. And so that's when I created that little book, The Universe and the Psyche. And as an introduction to that book, I, um, I created the, the $10,000 universe challenge, which is a simple key to the whole topic as far as I was concerned. So, it's a, been designed to create a thread of discussion or a, uh, an introduction to the, to the concepts of basically the universe, the psyche, um, theory of everything, mind of God, um, 
basically the whole the whole process. So, um, yeah, I, I think uh, the ten thousand dollar universe challenge, which I offer to anybody to have a crack at, is uh, is a good way to introduce the the subject. Well, we'll touch upon the challenge again later because for people who are wondering, well, what challenge to do what? This will be this will become clear as we work our way through this. What we're basically concerned with here, as I said, I talked about the big questions. It's life, the universe, and everything, isn't it? Really, or a theory of everything, as some people call it, and the origin of the universe and everything in it. I'll share this thought with you just at the top here because it doesn't necessarily slot in anywhere. It could, it could slot in anywhere in the discussion, but it's just because I've been doing some reading in the last few days. I've started to consider the sense it makes, because uh, people think of the universe as something that had to be created, you know, in a big bang or, or something similar. So, you know, it started at a particular point. It is a certain age. And yep. I'm beginning to lean in the direction of considering, because, you know, we can't know these things, that perhaps it wasn't created in the way that we think because we're we're operating in this sort of matter gravity uh, space time gravitational vault yes yeah exactly and but our reality may just be a subset of something bigger and the ideas of causation may be completely different at you know, the next level up as it were so i'm just to cut a long story short i'm just giving into allowing the idea that the basically the universe has been something that's eternal or something beyond it that that allowed it to come into being is eternal. Yeah, well, I mean, that's that's an old philosophical thread of thought for sure, the, the idea of the multiverse, that, that our universe is just one single droplet of pi, a pi universe, basically, because I'm using pi in the sense, the the traditional way of saying that it's the, the, uh, the, the, the law of octaves, where three primal powers move through seven steps to create octaves of creation in the realms of matter, consciousness, psyche, and... Uh, Matter, biology, consciousness, and psyche. Yes. So, um, I consider our universe to be a droplet of pi, and, and it, there's no reason why there can't be an endless ocean of of universes as well. So, in the multiverse concept, the, our our pi universe doesn't appear out of nothing at all. It appears and it's carried by uh, an, an, the ocean of the multiverse. Yeah. Yeah, and I will just say at this point, this might sound absurd, but for for listeners, we're not talking about apple pie here. We're talking about... No, no, sorry, yeah, sorry, the Greek, Greek pie, yes, yes. We, we think of pie as 22 over 7 or, you know, 3 point blah, 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 you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, but the t- traditional form of pie is, is, it's the, the, basically the input formula for the whole cosmic fractal. So it's, uh, it's the law of octaves which creates the octet structure of our universe. Think DNA, 64 DNA codons or, um, the structure of the periodic table of elements or subparticle chromodynamics, the, the gel man eightfold way, or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The number eight has been echoing throughout history through um, lots of different minds, you know, Tesla, Ramanujan, um, oh, it just goes on and on, Kepler, of course. So this this octet structure is, is if you're going to explore the universe, you will eventually come to the law of octaves and the octet structure. That's That's all I will say. And it'll be quite an important key uh, to space to come to, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we'll get to the numbers. We'll get to the numbers a little bit later. Just setting out the background to the discussion here, what we're looking at when we're thinking about life, the universe and everything, is today we're yep. basically stuck with a scientific materialistic view that uh, claims to have it more or less sorted out, except when you start looking at it, no, it hasn't. And exactly, it, in exactly. You, in your book, you explore ideas from the past, from high antiquity, what these uh, mystical traditions, for want of a better word, can tell us or suggest or point to, you know, the nature and structure of the universe. I mean, including, you know, for example, the I Ching is a good example. And it was really, really interesting to look at the the, the, the diagrams you put together. And some of this does touch upon numbers again. But um, it, it, it seems that there is a science and mysticism or spirituality, whatever we want to put it, go through periods of converging and diverging again and i think we've been through centuries of extreme divergence and i think yes, true, true. some of this some of this information is starting to come together again yep no i agree with that the, the the two rivers are starting to come back yes you're right yeah it's science has the this concept that it's it's solved the basic universe that it that it has a complete understanding of what's going on and 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 whatever it cannot solve at this present time are just mere triflings they're given a certain amount of time it will understand, but if you if you go into the scientific experience, then you discover that 
scientist A lost more than 95% of the universe into the non-baryonic fields of, of dark matter and dark energy, which traditionally have been called the breath of dragons. So you could quite easily switch those two words, subtle matter, dark matter, breath of dragons. So that science has lost most of the universe, and also science knows almost nothing about consciousness. Consciousness is a great riddle for science because it, it, it can't fit it into its little material structure that it's come up with. So it basically just says, well, consciousness is a, is a hallucination created by complex chemistry, which is, which is when, you, when you come to that strange belief, and it is a strange belief, you lose the vast dimensions of consciousness and awareness that surround us, you lose the structure of the psyche, you lose the search for diamond mind. So to, to draw the curtain in such a, a harsh and abrupt way upon the vast vistas of the universe, to me, is, is a colossal error, one of the great colossal errors of our age. Yeah? This idea that matter creates consciousness, that consciousness is simply complex chemistry, simply a hallucination created by complex chemistry. And I think that science is going to have to, to awaken from that error, which is which is the second of the four great riddles of appearance, yeah? which, which I describe in the book. Yeah, yep. you talk about these riddles of appearance, which are big, big questions, big mysteries about existence. And for example, the first one was the Earth was flat, the sun orbits the Earth, and the Earth is the center of the universe. Now, we managed to dispatch that. It took a lot of work, didn't it? It took a lot of work. Yeah, and some deaths. You know? but, uh, yeah, ult- and some deaths. Ultimately, yeah, yeah. it's moved things on. And as you just mentioned, the... The second riddle of appearance, and by the way, these are questions, are issues that are so big that most people just don't even bother considering it. You know, it just seems to be impossible. Yeah, and as you mentioned, consciousness arises from matter, but the matter arises from consciousness is where a lot of research is pointing now. And as as I mentioned earlier, it's kind of a synthesis of the scientific and what we called the mystical. I like the little um little story you related in the book about. Uh, mud creates frogs. I think that's quite uh, yeah. a, a useful. Yeah, yeah, it's a very useful image, isn't it? Yeah, to me, matter con- creates consciousness is the great, the great mystery of our age. It's, it's the great riddle. It's where humanity has come to in, in that sense. So, that's this is the riddle we're struggling with now. And if you can get through this riddle, then you'll discover there's two more, even more profound riddles lying beyond. Which is the third riddle is that the is that the ego structure appears to be separate from the surrounding universe. And the fourth riddle is that the eternal appears to be simply three dimensions of consciousness, those of deep sleep, dream, and waking. So in, in, in this mystic's model, matter is, is the densest form of consciousness. It is still consciousness, yeah? Yeah, yeah. So, and, and it's created by the surrounding vistas of consciousness and, and surrounding our, our material world, our waking dimension of consciousness, lies two vast dimensions, the dream dimension and the deep sleep dimension, yeah, with with the eternal of uh, dimension of awareness beyond that. So it's like the core Orm, 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 this is the Orm model from India, the core teaching. So we have four fundamental dimensions going on around us. So we have four bodies as well. We have our physical body, our dream body, deep sleep body, and the fourth body of the eternal, which is like a witnessing state, the awareness state. One thing that I've touched upon very often when discussing some of these big questions uh, with other guests is the appearance of underlying intelligence in the universe and some form of design appearing to be yep. in the natural yep. world. You know, whether you look down uh, in the dirt or whether you look up at the sky, that's how it appears to be. And I was reading just yesterday, you know, another article which is dismissing this, saying it's just the appearance of design. You know, this is complex organisms that you're talking about com- <laughs> complex systems so if it looks designed it's just because it's complex and it's, uh, it's sheer dumbass luck yeah yeah basically you know and i like the fact that you referenced uh, uh john martineau's book um a little book of coincidence in the universe um yes because that's one i picked up recently and it's astounding to look at the patterns in the cosmos which is you know what he's dealing with but you see this all the way down you know fractal patterns and you, yep. th- you then point out, and this is interesting for me, that a lot of science that's going on, well, actually it has gone on since the days of Newton and Darwin, but increasingly now with our better analytical tools and equipment, is that there's some very interesting patterns appearing in data all over the place when, when scientists are analysing you know, the fundamental nature of things. Yeah, I mean, well, from my perspective, it is the universe is totally a, a, a creation of a complex consciousness and an awareness. 
and it's uh, the reason it's not perfect. People say well, it was designed by 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 a divinity, then it would be perfect. But to me, it's a, it's part of the whole pie nature is that there will always be imperfection that because of its transcendental nature. If pi was weaving the mat- the cosmic matrix simply simply by a perfect octet structure, then everything would look like a, a cartoon. But because it has this transcendental quality, then everything is smooth and fractalized and and etc. It's a pattern of light and darkness. It's and and the universe is based on a duality of of two powers and and a light and darkness aspect to it. Because otherwise you can't you can't create a a, a realm of manifestation. So. There's always going to be imperfection, but behind, hidden in that imperfection lies something that is perfect, you know. Like the old Indian yogis say, from the perfect there rises the perfect. You just have to change the way you perceive things to discover there is an underlying harmony and an underlying perfection to what we perceive. Now, you devote quite a lot of the book discussing numbers, and I don't know if you've ever seen a book uh, called Who Built the Moon? But it's quite controversial it's because it's basically- funny. Funny, yeah. Okay. Now a friend of mine has actually asked, suggested I read that. Yeah, but I haven't actually got to it yet. Well, the the authors are suggesting that that the moon just doesn't make sense uh, in terms of you know just randomly being there. And yeah. the reason I mentioned the book is because they spend a lot of time talking about numbers, about how far the moon is from the Earth, and how that's yeah. a, a proportion yeah. of how far the moon is from the sun. And in your book, when you start to talk numbers, it's quite mind-boggling, actually, because I'm not a numbers person. But it's incredible some of the relationships that are that are out there. Yes, and you know, I agree. Even as you say, John Martineau's book is 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 stunning. The relationship between the distances for the moon and the the fact we have uh, um, yeah the symmetry going on between the Earth, the moon, and the sun, and the dance, and as they're weaving through the cosmos, creating spirals together, is creating this extraordinary harmony going on. And, and I mean, I only came, I, I'm not really actually into, really into numbers myself, actually. You might be surprised to that, but it's, uh, it's just where I ended up going, you know, and just, it all started clicking together, you know. So, just for me, like, the solar system is a very precise structure of matter consciousness. It's actually a power turbine of matter consciousness, which is the same idea that, that Russian astronomer Molkanov has, which I, I quoted in the book. That, that there's a complete relationship between the distance of the Earth from the Sun, between the vibration of the human psyche, and uh and also middle C and Western music at two hundred and fifty six hertz. There's there's a there's a serendipity going on between these these aspects. So I, it's it's something when I looked at it, I thought most people are gonna go think this is crazy. But it's also a concept that goes right back through Pythagoras. It's a concept that is that musicians for, for you know, two thousand years have been playing with, playing playing the, the, the harmony of the spheres as a musical creation. So it's not it's not my idea, it's, it's a very ancient idea, yeah. To cite another book that I don't know how I managed to not read this in the, whatever it is, 20 years since it was published, but, um, the holographic universe, uh, which yep. was quite ahead okay. of its time. And some of your information reminded me of some of the concepts <laughs> that came out in that in terms of inf- information being fundamental and there being basically a series of blueprints for, for, for life and for creation. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I mean, it's the, the old concept that if you took thread of DNA from every person on the planet, you could fit our entire DNA coils into a walnut shell, you know, like, and, and yet that, that, uh, those DNA coils are being created by, by a, a, a quantum background of intelligence, you know, which, which would appear to be not even a mist within that, that walnut shell. So to me, the, the appearance of our physical reality appearing around us is appearing from uh, very powerful um, source codes within the universe itself. I don't have any problem with with uh, that as a concept, you know. That 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 our universe appearing around us is a is a quantum image, you know. And then of course the question is, well, who's creating the image and where are they projecting it from? And in in mystical theory, that it's being projected from the dimension of deep sleep. Yeah, perhaps you could say a bit more about that because that's something that you. When you were talking about uh, later in the book, and maybe just expand upon that a little bit, just you know, flesh it out for people. Okay, well, in the Orm theory of creation, the, the the appearance of our universe around us, which I call the genie's bottle theory, is based on three dimensions of consciousness appearing as oct- octets of one another. So, deep sleep dimension is is seven times as powerful. As, as dream dimension, which is seven times as powerful as waking dimension. And I'm using the word seven because the law of seven, the law of octaves can be switched 
uh, seamlessly because if you take the first step, then you have seven steps to create an octave, and then and then that the eighth step becomes then the first step and the next octave, and then seven more steps, and so it goes on. This is how how the pi uh, matrix starts creating the whole universe is 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 how I perceive it. So all all the, if you like in deep sleep. Deep, like we create a movie, when we go to a movie, we go in the waking dimension of consciousness to a dark theater and, and we watch an image, a stream of images appearing on a screen. Well, the universe is a, a lot more elaborate. If it was going to make a, a cosmic movie, it uses three dimensions of consciousness. So all the projection equipment, all the primal images, all the, all the, the, the source powers are existing in the dimension of deep sleep. And from there they project out and they create realities of dream, dream dimension, and waking dimension. So if you can go deep enough into meditation, you'll go back into a place where you'll go into the darkness of deep sleep. And there, if you stay in, in wakefulness and awareness in that space, that's when the magic happens and you jump to the, to the fourth dimension of the eternal, which is the awakening or Buddha nature or whatever you want to call it. So that's like, that's the goal of human destiny is to create a loop of, of a journey of becoming into the ego self and then loop back and come back through and come back to the to the witnessing center, the state of I am that we leave from in the first place. So in that sense, our whole universe is, is a is a dream time flickering matrix of creation. I've be recently been reading uh, Tom Campbell's work and uh, the stuff on transcendental meditation is, is very interesting. I think that's something I might like to to try and develop that. So I don't know if you practice meditation or if even the, of the transcendental variety, but in terms of getting to that, that, that particular place, that space, um, that does seem to be one of the potential keys. Yes, certainly meditation is, meditation is the key really to, um, to uncovering the majesty that's around us. I don't do transcendental, transcendental meditation, but I do do more classical meditation. So, this is this is to me is is the path of remembrance for ourselves. The whole, the whole, the, the universe is a little or a play of consciousness where we we get thrown out into incarnation, and then we we have to journey through the the up coming up through the centers in the body basically as I describe in the book, uh, in the psyche. So uh, you can imagine that the wheel is something like this. You come in through the fontanelle, the crown of the head. You descend to the back of the heart space, which is wisdom heart space. Then when we're born, we get thrown out through the front of the heart space in a great arc of psychic destiny down to the feet. There we draw the shroud of ego around ourselves and then we journey back up through the body. We've got to come back up through the energy centers to get back to that wisdom heart space. So at our, at our feet, we're at birth. By the time we hit knees, we're about six. By the time we reach the pelvis, puberty, we're about 10, 12, 13, whatever. Then we have to get through the emotional centers, the mind centers and the ego center to return to wisdom heart center. So it's kind of like a, a play of consciousness that we've entered by being born and by incarnating. Well, there's also the idea that, yeah, th th lots of people have spoken of this down the ages, that that we are here to experience something and that also the idea that there's perhaps one entity, one being, which is has manifested itself in this realm in order to, and in order to enter you know, that yes. forgetfulness and to experience yes. different aspects yes. of itself. Yes. No, I totally agree, 100%. That's, that's how I, uh, perceive it as well, is that, I mean, when that, that third riddle I talked about, there's the ego appears to be separate from the surrounding universe, which when you think about it is an absurd concept because the ego is part of the universe and yet it appears to be separate from the surrounding universe. I think Einstein called it an optical delusion of consciousness. It's one of the great, source source riddles of the universe why does that ego structure appear to be separate yeah but that's the only way that the leader or a play of consciousness can move is if is if the, that eternal nature draws around itself the shroud of the personal self and goes out and pretends that it, that it is mortal and going on a journey that's how it experiences its own nature but the universe is not supposed to be it's only supposed to be a a, a leela where to go on a journey and then to awaken from you know the whole jack game is not to get lost in it yeah it's a, it's 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 uh, the point of the point of the journey is still to come back to to wakefulness and awakening yeah which is a state that we call diamond mind and if you ever come to diamond mind you you'll find something extraordinary is that the entire universe and everything that you thought you are 
now appears as just flickering images within a, a state that you could call a diamond. It appears it's it's like an infinite diamond, but it's 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 the whole universe now is just flickering images, and you and it's almost a sense of how could I possibly have imagined that I was that? It's like a it's a it's a it's a moment of wakefulness. Yeah. So that's kind of the journey we have to come back towards is to get back to that diamond. And in Buddhism, it's called diamond mind. It's uh, it's an astonishing state compared to normal normal waking human existence. You know, which is why the Buddha said something like, "Better one moment of awakening than a hundred lifetimes of normal existence." Yeah. Yeah. So that is, reminds me a little bit. You talk about that experience. That we're having is it's almost like going to the cinema, as you mentioned earlier. Also, like, a bit like uh, Plato's yeah. k- Plato's cave allegory, I suppose. It is, yeah, totally, hundred percent. Plato's cave allegory to me is is um, I mean, from my perspective, is a quite crude example of uh, of of the Orm theory. The Orm theory to me is beautiful, elegant, astonishing, and Plato's cave theory is like a very simple, crude attempt at it. You know, even though. Some universities have courses that run for years on Plato's cave theory, etc., and it's still it's still echoing for the last two and a half thousand years, whatever. But yeah, yeah I mean Plato's cave theory and our creation very similar. I, I I have it's totally you know the creating light is behind us. You know everything we see is shadows. Is is the same concept as diamond mind and everything in the universe just appearing as as shimmering images or moving reflections. You know. I mean, there's tremendous weight still given to, you know, Greek philosophy and what have you. And in some cases, with good reason. I mean, I did a, I studied politics, international relations at university, and we had a whole entire section of the course just all about Greek philosophy. Initially, I kind of struggled with it. It's kind of like, why are we doing this? You know, but then yeah. it, was, it was seen as underpinning so many things. So that was kind of, it was afforded this uh, importance. Yeah. Okay. I personally have gone very little near Greek philosophy apart from stuff that I've studied myself on the side but it's yeah i mean it's it's greek philosophy is is comes from egypt and egypt and china and india they all interconnect so when i talk about a a basic mystic thread running behind all these things it's 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 something that you once you understand the language then you you go to wherever you go you go to china you go to greece you go to to egypt india that's all the same language you go to tibet you know tibet will say that if you have sufficient merit when you die, you will pass through the great luminosity and, and, and go into, no, sorry, you'll pass through the great transparency and go into the great luminosity. And this is exact same idea of, of, uh, of the, the awakening, the awakening into that diamond mind space. So wherever you start looking, once you get away from the, 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 the basic difference in images, you discover that you're all talking the same thing. You know, whether you're using Greek pie, whether you're using, Egypt, the um, the flower of life symbol. Whether you're using going to China and, and seeing uh, the yin yang, you know, um, the yin yang or the bagua or the I Ching, or you go to India and you see Orm, the Orm symbol, or you go to the to the Kashmir Shaivism, which is one of the great philosophical schools of India, which basically their theory of everything has uh, 36 tattvas or powers in it. But again, it's all it's all mirroring off the same simple concept: three three dimensions of consciousness. One dimension of the eternal awareness, which is the witnessing space. So, and that's, that's Plato's cave allegory as well, you know. So it's, it's all, it's all just, you know, different words for the same structure, the same psychic structure that we're, we're dwelling within. Well, I think it's interesting to consider some of these, you know, some of the ancient uh, ideas and concepts that you're talking about, how they explain, uh, what we experience. A, you know, more elegantly and completely than we've been able to do with a lot of, you know, contemporary and modern, uh, yes. sci- science. And we look yep. at, uh, and this is not, but, you know, I always stress this point. This is not to say that any one of those mystical traditions has got the complete picture. We, I mean, who can say? And it's certainly not to denigrate, uh, you know, the, the more mundane aspects of modern science, which has transformed the world and our lives in many ways. But yep. n- nevertheless, when you look at the world of uh, quantum physics, it's an- interesting just to see how some of the concepts and some of the language that started to be used there over over the years is starting to sound a lot like, you know, some of these older ideas. Yeah, <laughs> totally, totally. Which is extraordinary because you think, see, the, the stuff I'm talking about is is 
at least 5,000 years old. You know, the, the I Ching has a 5,000 year tradition. If I say that the Ulm, Ulm model has a 5,000 year tradition, you know, back through the Vedas, I'm just insulting it. Yeah. So it's really interesting that, that these, these men and women back at that age, that's 200 human generations were, this, were, were unraveling these concepts that we're struggling with now and doing it a lot better than we are, you know, to me, I mean, if you're going to reinvent the wheel, make sure you do a really good job of it because you're going to look doubly stupid, aren't you? You know, so it's like when I watch science trying to unravel the, the, the riddles of the universe at the moment, I just, I just think, my God, they're doing it in such a clumsy, stupid way that, that, you know, how could they have done it 5,000 years ago if we're struggling now? And I still find that a, a bit of a riddle, you know, whether, whether the human resonance around the earth is, was, was, was vibrating at a higher vibration than it is now, like up 13, 13 hertz rather than 7.83 hertz at the moment, something like that. So they had, like the windows to the cosmos were open because you look at their work and it's just, it's just fabulous. It's just astonishingly beautiful, you know. And, uh, and everything when I watch science, all they're doing is proving the old concepts from 5,000 years ago. You know, if you look at, at Joel Mann's subparticle chromodynamics with the eightfold nature for, for subparticles, that's, you're straight, straight back to Greece and the, and the, the octet nature for the universe, you know. Um, if you look at dark matter, well, dark matter and dark energy to me are, are just words and labels for the background dimension for deep sleep and dream. And the mystics will say that those two, two powers will create 97.959 blah, blah, blah percent of the universe. So, to as many decimal places as you want. So, and whereas modern science predicts that it's probably about 95% and has absolutely no idea of what it is. Yeah. So it's, it's astonishing that wherever science steps now, 64 codons of DNA, there's a perfect mirror again for the, for the 64 hexagrams of the I Ching. And, and the pi concept is again, is, is mirrored all through science now as a transcendental number. So, when, wherever science looks now and unfolds and reveals the deeper layers behind it, all they seem to do is prove the, the old concept from 5,000 years ago, which is why I have the, the $10,000 universe challenge, which is between the, the creation model put together by the mystics and the creation model put together by modern science. And my money's on the mystics, which is crazy, isn't it? You think about it. I'm putting ten grand on guys who lived 5,000 years ago and saying that their creation model is better and fits the facts of the universe more profoundly than science's uh, creation model does today, you know. So, and, and I give that challenge as as a, a seed for discussion, for um, you know, for for a journey into a, a theatre of ideas, for people to have a concepts. Maybe I've got it wrong. So I'm quite happy to pay ten grand to somebody to say you've got it wrong, and this is why. Blah 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 blah. You know. So it's a, offered in good faith. To, to people to go and explore the journey, you know, and it's only two models. I'm only offering A or B, you know, so it's not like it's, it should be a very simple, if you can reduce the universe to two simple models, it shouldn't take long to discover which one is correct. The way I've looked at this, it's become increasingly clear that you get these different traditions and different ways, different models, to use your word, and you see it's not that modern science has somehow got everything wrong, but far from it. But there's little no, no. there's little kernels of truth all over the place. It's just putting it together. It's just take, looking at a bigger picture. And as I mentioned earlier, it's just synthesis, you know, bringing together things that are falsely opposed. Yeah, no, I agree 100%. I mean, I, I totally love science and what they're doing, you know, and it's, 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 it's totally a wonderful stepping process that's going on. And the only thing I see when I look at conscious is at science is they are so terrified of the word consciousness. It's just a it's just a a concept that most science just reels from in, in horror and confusion, and it's like stepping up to the abyss, you know. And and yet consciousness is the key to everything. If you if you're not talking about the universe in terms of consciousness and awareness, you're you're not even in the ballpark. Is is from my perception, yeah. So when I look at science, I think they are just very clumsily because. They, they accept the appearance to their physical senses in the waking dimension of consciousness. Then they get out their tape measure and they start measuring things and they start predicting things, which is what science is all about, measuring and predicting, you know. But they're working in, they're, they're trusting the appearance to their physical senses in the waking dimension of consciousness. And that is a big error to do, you know. That is a, that is a, a colossal error in terms of, of, 
the understanding the nature of the universe. Yeah, that's like the classic image of the Buddha, where you turn within and you start watching the 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 not so much the not so much the universe, or not even the lamp of mind, which is observing the universe, but you start to observe the self, which holds aloft the lamp of mind, which observes the universe. So, it's like you're coming back into the the core nature of awareness and perception. I think that was something, a really important thing that we've touched upon there, is most of the universe being hidden to us. And this brings up the question of the limits of our perception. You know, it's the idea, again, with modern science is that if only enough time and money is ploughed into this, if we think of the Hadron Collider, for example, that we, exactly. can, that we can get to the root of this. I think, isn't the Hadron Collider like the most complex machine ever built in the history of yeah. humankind? And I agree. Yet these concepts, as you mentioned, of dark matter, dark matter, dark energy, even black holes in the Higgs boson itself, these are concepts, sometimes you know, mathematically expressed or theories. And, and I've had people come back to me and say, "Oh well, you know, all science is theories, you know, but that's <laughs> doesn't really get us much further ahead." But they're coming uh, up, coming up with a load of names as if you can name something mm-hmm. that is somehow on the road to understanding it. But they still talk about as a particle structure. They're still looking at it in terms of matter. They're not even looking at the, the perceiving consciousness. They're not. They're just. They're talk- I mean, when I look at the, the the Hydrogen Collider, to me, I think of that as we were talking before about the frog in the mud. In the Middle Ages, the spontaneous generation theorists, who were scientists, watched frogs crawling out of the mud, and said, "Ah, it's the nature of mud under certain conditions to spontaneously turn into a frog." So we now know that's absurd. It takes billions of years of evolution to turn into, to, to, from mud to turn into frogs, yeah? But, I mean, this is just a change in time scale. Science in 500 years has changed the time scale. It still believes that mud creates frogs. It just doesn't quite understand the mechanism that's going in there. But all it's done is change the time scale. But the, the old spontaneous generation theorists would have looked at the mud and thought, well, the essence of frog is in the mud. So if we smash it between a couple of bricks, we'll knock out the essence of frog. Like, that's just a natural human kind of scientific space to go to, you know. And the the Hydrogen Collider is just like two bricks trying to smash matter together, thinking that they're going to knock out the essence of frog. I mean, it's, it's on one level, philosophically, it's an absurd concept. And, and I always thought they'd proved that the entire universe was a quantum, a quantum image anyway, that quantum meaning light plus information. So... The, you know, the, I don't quite understand where they're going with it. But anyway, this, this is, they're, all they're doing is smashing mud between two bricks and thinking they're going to knock out the essence of frog. It's, it's, the, it's, it's a great invention, but it's one of the dumbest machines you'll ever come across if you're looking for an understanding of the universe. If you're looking for the understanding of matter, hold it for a ball game, then it makes beautiful sense. But you're not going to understand the structure of the universe through, through you know, doing that process. It's something like, it's actually, you know, to me, it's like something out of a Gary Larson cartoon, you know? You know, Gary Larson with a, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, the primal scientist with his tongue hanging out of his mouth, bashing, you know, it's just, that's all it is, you know? It's crazy. <laughs> well, I think that idea I mentioned a moment ago about the limits to our perception is that we're working with our five senses, but we also have what some people call a sixth sense or a, a spidey sense or, you know, just this intuition, this, that something else is going on. And, I think the idea that that we, in our current form and in, in this incarnation, should necessarily be able... It's just interesting, I think, that we, some of us, believe that we can understand everything, that we can rationalise everything that, that's, that exists when, as we pointed out, we're up to, like, well, less than 5% <laughs> of, of, yeah. of, of, of what we have observed so far. Yeah let alone of what we have not observed in terms of multiverse and everything else, you know. You know, agreed, agreed. So, you know, but but my, my perception is that the universe is completely knowable and completely understandable apart from the, the primal trinity, which is the three source powers of our universe. There is something magic there that, that no mind and no mystic has ever, ever unraveled, as far as I, I have seen. It's considered to be the most most astonishing three dance of three primal powers and all the mystic does is, is turn the attention back on the witnessing self and, and go into that. So I'll always say that totally at the core of the universe is this mysterious mysterious power and mysterious realm, 100%. But I also say that the universe is very knowable and very understandable. In fact, 
it, the universe is you know when you're a kid you you built you built castles out of a few boxes and a couple of chairs and a blanket yeah mm -hmm. that kind of space mm -hmm. of, with your imagination you built that's what you built and if you go into the into the core nature of the universe you'll discover that it's just a few boxes a couple of blankets you know and that's all it is I, I i describe the universe as a play of 31 powers of consciousness yeah they're boxes and blankets that's all they are and when you wake up from that dream you will be astonished that you were so captivated by a few boxes and blankets. That's all I'll say. Yeah. You can do it. It's People have been doing it for thousands of years, have been waking up from the Leela or the dream of consciousness of those three dimensions to, to that witnessing state of diamond mind. It's not unknowable. The universe is not, is not vast and unknowable. It's, you're just supposed to walk in, get a sense of it, and then return to the witnessing self. You know? that's, uh, that's my perception. Uh, you mentioned uh, evolution a moment ago, and just a, a quick word on that um, from from my perspective. A lot of these ideas that we're discussing from the mystical perspective, people who are you know cr critics would say, well, you know, this is this is this is magical thinking. We we, we can't test it, we can't measure it, you know. So therefore, Agreed. et cetera, et cetera. But yeah. when it, when it comes to evolution, I've always I I think there's some questions to answer about evolution the established theory that that don't really hold up now this doesn't mean evolution clearly happens but i'm just not so sure that we've got the whole story let's put it that way but e even if e even if evolution happens exactly as darwin postulated and we do know everything and understand everything to me that in itself is magical i mean what would the chances be of all that randomness delivering what we see around us if you take my point yeah. of view i think yeah. whether, whether it's downward causation from some mysterious force or whether it's bog standard evolution from mud both of them are incredible uh, propositions yeah no i agree and and the, the the random one to me is so absurd that that you can you can erase it in a sense but yeah the science basically says there is no god but mud and the law of natural selection is his only son i mean that's kind of the, my throwaway line on it yeah they, they've made a deity out of the law of natural selection. The law of natural selection is just a very, very minor part of co of the play of consciousness. And to to make that as the and throwing that as the deity is is kind of absurd, you know. But that's that's my sense on it, you know. But uh, I have respect for the whole evolutionary process. I have no problem with that. But to say that the law of natural selection is now the deity that that Darwin is now you know enthroned as God, to me is crazy. It's just it's just it's ignorance, actually. I, I, okay, here's something I just I jotted down before, actually. Because um, we were talking about the, the mystics creation model, and I, I sort of described it roughly what's going on. But it, it, further, if the mystics creation model is correct, then we now have the input formula for the cosmic fractal, the source for the transcendental number pi. We have the reason for the octet structures of matter and biology, such as the 64 codons of DNA, the atomic structure, the periodic table of elements, and the subparticle realms of chromodynamics. We have the nature and values for the mysterious realms of dark matter and dark energy. We have the source for the Fibonacci structure for our solar system, revealed to be a power turbine of matter consciousness. We have the theory of everything, a construct of the powers of consciousness and awareness which create the appearance of our universe. We have the source for the octet structures of the human psyche and Western music. And we can at last describe the journey of awakening from the reflected light of the ego sense to the creating light of eternal awareness. And I'm doing all that with a creation model that is 5,000 years old. So, so to me, that's probably covered most of the big, big questions of science. And I've said, look, those questions can be answered if you change the model that you are using. If you think the earth is flat, then you've got some serious problems. How does the sun get underneath? What holds the sun up? What are uh, the earth up? Whatever, whatever, yeah? If you change the model to a round earth, suddenly everything starts making sense. If you think that, that, that matter is the source of the, uh, space-time gravitational vault and primal matter is the source of the universe, you end up with endless flat earth riddles of, of, of how it all comes together. But if you move to the consciousness awareness model, suddenly everything makes sense. It's just beautiful and it's elegant and it's, it's it's harmonious. It's the you know it's the hidden splendor. Change the model that we use for the universe. That's only my my suggestion. Yes. One thought I had when considering the 
the fact that you know most of the universe appears to be hidden to us and may well mostly not be matter as we think of it. Um, I guess you could infer from that 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 could apply to us and our our actual existence. That is to say that if there is consciousness beyond the human form, beyond death, then the, the, its experience would uh, experience in incarnated in our form would just be a tiny little sliver. Yes. Of yes. overall experience. Yes, no, I agree. The Buddha says, "Treat your life as if it's a shower of sparks." Agreed. That what you incarnate as in your physical form in this lifetime, this 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 arc of however between zero and seventy years or whatever, is just an absolute, just a tiny soap bubble in an entire ocean of who you are. Yeah, and you are dreaming that this is your entire universe, and and when this when this soap bubble pops, this body drops. That you will disappear and be gone forever, yeah. In other words, you're a short time alive and a long time dead is the concept, yeah. All part of the leader on the play of the universe because, you know, you you existed before you were physically born and you will exist after you physically die. In the in in the conscious awareness creation model, yeah. Uh, I was very interested in one section of the book where you're talking about sound and frequencies, and you got into the the idea of there being a, a missing planet in our solar system. And that's something that's an idea that's been around for a very long time. And uh, again, people have speculated that it might have been out where the asteroid belt is. And uh, you, you give this some serious consideration. Yeah, it's true. I mean, it's, it's something I was surprised that I started getting involved in. But but I started contemplating this idea of of the distance of the Earth from the sun and vibrations of human psyche. And was there a, was there a connection? So... I started looking at it, and, and my vibration for the normal human psyche is around around 200 hertz or so, you know. So I went and looked at the distance the Earth was from the sun. It was 150 million kilometers. And, and I thought, well, that's totally astonishing. Why, why are they like a, almost like a perfect mirror of what I think they should be? So I went and checked out what a meter is, you know, because I thought a meter must be some sort of cosmic measurement. And then I discovered that a meter is a measurement of the speed of light within a vacuum. And it just sort of clicked. I just thought, oh, okay, this is, this is, this is all part of the whole play and therefore the way the planets are laid out is is done in Fibonacci steps which is the old um, cosmic hopscotch where you reach behind and grab the last step and throw it in front of you so it goes like 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21 etc and if you follow the way the planets are laid out then up to Mars there's a there's a natural Fibonacci sequence and then there's a, a complete abyss where where the the um, uh, the the missing planet or the the broken broken planet exists. Yeah, there's a Kuiper belt I kind of remember now. And then once you get to Jupiter, anyway, there's a whole new Fibonacci sequence starts again. So I thought, oh, that's interesting. It's like the whole musical scale is broken there, and that's why we tend to experience ourselves as slightly alienated from the cosmos because the missing step is missing. So if we could learn to to tone and tune that that distance, which should be about 450 hertz. That's that's the, the the missing planet vibration. Then somehow we would link and we'd be able to start stepping up into the higher octaves, which at present we we tend to be contracted back. And that's part of living on on, on planet Earth because that missing planet there's a there's a vibration in that that uh, because the solar system is like a, a power turbine of matter consciousness created by the speed of light. Then then. We're we're missing a, a profound tone there in the universe. That's just my my sense of it. We should learn to tone that 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 space. But but one other thing was when I was I, I thought oh this is interesting. Laid it out. I thought nobody will believe this, but what the hell? And, and then I came across Molkanoff and different things and and uh, uh, a little book of coincidence, which all just explored exactly the same concepts. So I thought oh okay. But I thought okay, if there's a missing planet, if there's another planet past Pluto. Where would it exist? And according to the way it's laid out, I thought it's going to it's going to exist about 11 billion kilometers from the sun, and it's going to be connected to a connected to a meridian, a meridian of consciousness, which is uh, 100 from memory 130 billion kilometers from the sun. And and a few months later, they discovered Sedna, which which does that huge elliptical orbit between those two distances. And I, I nearly fell over in the you know when I when I read it, I thought that's unbelievable. Just just it was just one of those serendipitous dipitous things that you just sort of think, well, I don't know where that came from, but so so the matter the matter consciousness power turbine of the solar system is a very small part of the thing that I play with, but 
it was a thing I found of interest at the time, so that's why I, I put it in the book. Um, I did an interview with uh, a guy called Walter Cruttenden. I don't know if you've ever come across his work, but the interview was based on his book, uh, Lost Star of Myth and Time. And one speculation he was going into, which ties in some, somewhat with what you were saying, is that he was thinking that the the 26,000 year procession of the equinoxes could affect yeah. could affect human consciousness but also the 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 traveling of our solar system around the galaxy which takes you know is it 200 million years or whatever that yep. as we move through different areas of the galaxy it will affect human consciousness and i was just thinking about that in terms of everything we've been saying and it, you know again it's something interesting to consider yeah, I mean, I, I consider this too because I'm astonished that people 5,000 years ago put it, get, put it, could have put together this view of the universe while we find it so hard to, to grapple these concepts today. It's almost like we've, we're journeying into a, into a, a veil of, through a veil of ignorance or something. So somewhere at some point, for whatever reason, whether it was human resonance vibration or passing through some celestial awakening or something, Maybe it was ET turning up, who knows, but there was <laughs> something that enabled people to experience these things, you know, in a very profound way and it literally catalogued the whole process. You know, you, you look at the tatvas of Kashmir Shaivism, and Shaivism, to me that's the most astonishing creation of the entire human mind. I, I know of nothing that can, go, comes even close to matching that. It's, it is astonishing and beautiful. So the fact that they could do that when we, when we think they're in the dark ages, you know, beyond the dark ages, this is a little bit of a mystery to me as well. And I don't, I don't know whether it's that, whether we pass through an enlightened space in the universe, human resonances, maybe, I don't know. I don't know. Who knows? But all I can say is they did it. And, and that's why I, I, um, I, I put their model up against scientists' modern model today with its, with its belief in space time, gravity, primal matter, the law of natural selection, you know, and that's, that's end of story. That's it. To me, that is, that's that's beyond beyond uh, ignorance, actually. The um, hopping back and forth a little bit now between different things, but in the section of the book where you're talking about again about patterns, you get into talking about spirals, and I'm reminded yep. again of the idea of uh, as above, so below, because everything from DNA right up through um, to the nature of uh, you know the galaxies themselves, the spiral galaxies. There's these repeating patterns. Now you mentioned fra yeah. fractals earlier, and yep. um, so and, and as above, so below. That's that's an ancient maxim. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, Michael Hayes' thing is where there are spirals, there is life. You know, I think it's a it's a good concept. It's uh, there's a lot of truth to it, and and also this idea that even science totally admits is the entire scaffolding of the universe is hidden from what we're perceiving. The way the the way the stars and the galaxies are moving. There's not enough matter in the in those stars and galaxies to move in the patterns that they move. So they're moving in this this element that they call dark matter. You know, I would say they're being projected as a quantum image from the dimension of deep sleep. You know, ultimately, but they are moving within a soup of some mysterious non-baryonic thing, which they don't know what it is. But if if consciousness has a non-baryonic aspect, because the consciousness appears to be in the body and yet outside the body at the same time. And dark matter has a non-baryonic aspect. Is it possible that they're the same thing? Is it possible the universe is a structure of consciousness? You know, to me, it's just a, that's a tiny step to take. But for Western science, that's like, you know, 15 dimensions too far. Well, as a point I must have made 50 times with doing these shows is that science and just the general populace who are of a, you know, scientific consciousness that they're, if they're interested at all, then that's the, you know, that's the people that they look to. You get the guys in the lab coats. Yep. Everyone yep. who's of a scientific materialistic mindset and then rejects anything mystical and non-material, they're worried. And I said this, you know, in the last show I did actually, they're obviously concerned about religion and God and all the rest of it because they, they see a, a, a continuum, a con direct connection between mystical ideas and religions. And then, of course, they look at the world that we currently live in and they see all this mayhem in the name of religion and they don't want to make that connection because if you open the door to 
some yeah. f- underlying fundamental force or intelligence, then l- loads of people who are of a religious mindset, they, well, they leap up and go, ah, we told you, it's God. I agree. No, I agree. This is something science is going to have to grow up and now have a look at, you know. I know they spent 500 years nailing the concept of, see, I don't really use the word God, but, you know, you can use the word God. 500 years nailing the concept of God into a coffin and then, and then in painting the law of, the, the law of, uh, um, natural selection on the top to, to, as the, the kind of, you know, to, to keep it buried. And now it's springing up everywhere. The, the energy space of awareness consciousness is, is exploding everywhere. And science, unless it's going to look like a complete idiot, is going to have to move with it as well, you know. And I know it's hard for science because it loves to walk around with a, with a, with a measuring tape and, and making predictions and measuring things. And, and this requires a different level of being and a different level of mind, you know. Well, I use the word God simply because that's where, that's where yeah. pe- people go. Whether it's, yeah. uh, scientists being critical, they say, oh, you know, God, don't be stupid. Or whether it's religious people, particularly people who are religious in a, you know, quite a blind, slavish way. They're, they're doing yeah. it, they're doing it because it's been done all that time, you know, and they're, I've met lots of people who were claimed to be religious, but actually they're just, they might as well be cult members. And, uh, <laughs> sure. you know, they'll use the yeah. word God, that's all. And it's, you know, it, uh, yeah, sure. it, it's got a powerful resonance, that, but you know, it attracts people it's, and it repels it's, people. Yeah, no, I agree 100%. It's, it's a powerful concept and a powerful word. That's why I prefer to talk about things in terms of awareness and consciousness, because everybody has a different image of what God is, you know, whether it's Shiva or Jesus or Buddha or whatever. So, this is just like hanging a form upon that which is formless, you know. But um, so I, I try and stay away from that and just stay with the formless aspect, just because that's kind of my nature anyway. But if somebody wants to use personal forms for a deity, I have no problem, and I find them uh, a much more intelligent structure than simply a matter scientist who says, "Bang, you know, space-time, gravity, primal matter, that's it, baby. You know, do your seventy years, you're dead. Forget it." You know, to me, that's that is the most contracted form of almost any philosophy you can have. And, and if you're going to use the word God, then I would also call that satanic. That is, that is called the triumph of the law of matter. And it's got a history of, you know, as many years as you want as well. I, I actually jotted down a couple of things just for, before I came on here too, which maybe uh, sort of relates to this. We face human catastrophe because of two acts of forgetfulness which darken the human sun. They are the strange beliefs that matter creates consciousness and that money is debt. When we believe that matter creates consciousness, then consciousness becomes simply a hallucination created by complex chemistry and we lose the vast dimensions of consciousness and awareness which surround us, including the essence of the human psyche and the quest for diamond mind. When we believe that debt is money, then we create our money supply as privatized debt burden with compound interest and we walk into the abysses of usury while believing that these are the laws of money and that there is no other way. We even forget to ask two fundamental questions which have echoed throughout history. Who gets the power to create the money supply and who gets the profits from the streams of interest? So I, to me, to me, the, the, the idea that the universe is just a space-time gravitational vault is, is, uh, is a, is a tremendous power of ignorance and forgetfulness. And it's used by almost every fascist government that has existed in history which has tried to contract the people into a certain form um, as to an understanding of who they are and who the universe is. So they'll go out and, you know, start wars, spread the money system as a plague, whatever. So there's, there's a huge power to the universe surrounding this, these ideas of what's the basic model for the universe to use. If you go with a consciousness awareness model, you'll move in a whole different way than if you go with with a space-time gravitational primal matter model, which is based on, you know, the, the rule of, of fang and claw, and which is a short time dead, uh, a short time alive and a long time dead. Because I find so many people are disassociated because they just say, I'll be dead soon, so who cares? And that is such a calamity in terms of how we should be living. Because, believe me, well, you know, from my perspective, when you are dead, you ain't, that is not the end, you know. That might be the first day that you actually have to face the responsibility for being an incarnated being. So, to, to which way you walk with these two models for the universe has, has tremendous power, tremendous history. There's tens of millions of people in graves because you walk one way and not the other. Or we, we misunderstood the basic model. 
you know. So we used a religious war to go out and kill people, which is as absurd as, as anything else, you know. So it's a, it's a very delicate subject with a lot of power and a lot of history, you know. Yeah, I read a good quote recently. It was actually in an obituary for a guy, a musician who died, and it was his own quote, and he'd said, um, uh, there is no death, there's just a change of our cosmic address. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, that's not a bad concept. That's that's how I perceive it anyway as well. That's how 5,000 years of mystical tradition perceives it too, you know. I mean, my kind of my focus has been, because I have a scientific background, yeah, so I mean, I, I came up through the scientific kind of thing. But, I, I, I mean, maybe it's my nature, you know, to pick a prize fight, you know, but it's almost like I, I, I throw that, my challenge, onto the table and say to the, to the scientists, have a crack. See what you can do. See where you can go with this. I'll throw 10,000 bucks on the table. I'll say that the mystics from 5,000 years ago know the universe better than you do. Yeah? And all I ask you to is with, with coherence and logic, prove, prove your case and prove the concept. So it's, a, it's a, like a prize fight for the universe in that sense. Yeah? So I must have a certain adversarial, adversarial streak in my nature to even propose it. But I think I think the way science looks at the universe is something so stupid, it's like, as I said, something out of a Gary Larson cartoon, and I offer it in a way to try and move the discussion because, you know, I think that if we don't wake up within our next few generations, we've got an excellent chance of turning this planet back into a carbon soup. So we're going to have to, we're going to have to move very fast on this because we're running out of time real quick, you know. And a lot of the stuff I presented in that little book is, has always been secret and kept secret, you know. But now I think it's time for the whole world to start looking at it, start really addressing it, because if we do not move very fast, then there's a lot of sociopathic people tucked away who have a lot of power now who are moving our consciousness and our earth into a position where we can literally turn it back into a carbon soup, you know. Yes, I, I totally agree. I, I do like a quote in your book, um, the universe is not simply an empty wasteland of primal matter, but that it is the vast body of a conscious being. I just love that idea. It resonates again. That's not very scientific, but it does resonate with yeah. me. So it's no, poetic. Yeah, it yeah. is. And I think you're, you're absolutely right. Those two areas that you mentioned, uh, there's huge potential for the future of our planet and huge danger as well and i'll just throw in by the way that if people wonder why you jumped onto the subject of money that's something else that you're you're working on another sort of parallel thing that does yeah. has a lot of relevance and hopefully we'll be talking about that at some point in the future but i mean as we bring things to a close for today race just tell folks about where they can get the book where they where they can claim their 10 grand and yeah you know, <laughs> sh- sh- share your website and anything else you'd like to put out there Okay, so I've got a website called quanta.co, Q-U-A-N-T-A, Q-U-A-N-T-A-R dot C-O. That's not dot com, dot C-O. Um, which is, which is a, a now a money based kind of, um, website because I've kind of moved along a bit. I've got interested in money now, but all the source material is there as well. So you can download the free ebook, which is called The Universe and the Psyche. And also you'll find links there to the $10,000 Universe Challenge. Um, the challenge is also included in the book. Um, so I'll be look forward to anybody who has any attempt or any idea to uh, take $10,000. It's offered in good faith. And um, it's designed to start a, a thread of discussion. And um, any any um, inquiries or suggestions come through, I'll... Uh, I'll stay in touch with Greg and uh, we can uh, share the, the ongoing process. Excellent. Well, Reese, thank you so much for joining us today on LegalizeFreedom.com. Okay, thanks a lot. Take care. Well, folks, that's it for another week. As ever, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed the show, check out the website, which is LegalizeFreedom.com. That's Legalize-Freedom.com, where you'll find an archive of programs offering alternative views on a wide range of topics, including politics and economics, energy and environment, culture, spirituality, history, and the nature of reality. You can also browse and buy a range of publications from our guests, and if you're feeling generous, make a donation to help keep the site up and running. Based on current audience numbers, if everyone who tuned in donated just five pence per show, that's about eight cents US, this could become a full-time, fully funded operation, offering more and more often. During October 2014, Over 50,000 of you streamed or downloaded at least one show. 
Total donations were seven UK pounds, which currently converts to about eleven dollars US. Whether you listen, donate, or do both, I greatly appreciate your support. Until next time, I'm Greg Moffat, and you've been listening to LegalizeFreedom.com. <laughs>